My name is Dr. Suzanne Paul, and I'm the keeper of rare books and early manuscripts at Cambridge University Library. And I'm delighted to be introducing the second of our Sanders Lectures in Bibliography uh, for 2023 on the subject of Cambridge bookbinding 1450 to 1770. Our lecturer this year, Dr. David Pearson, retired in 2017 after a long and distinguished career managing libraries, mostly in London. Since then, he has spent a significant proportion of his time in Cambridge University Library as a researcher, as an honorary colleague, and as a fount of wisdom on bindings, provenance, and other aspects of book history. It has been an enormous privilege to have him study our collections and my colleagues in the Rare Books team and our conservators and imaging specialists have all learned a great deal from David and from working with him. We're delighted to welcome him here this evening to speak to us. At the end of the talk, there is time for questions from the audience um, and that includes those of you watching online. If you are watching online and you have a question, uh, you can submit it on Zoom chat or the Q&A functions um, on, on Zoom. So last night, David talked to us about the 15th and 16th centuries. Tonight, we're focusing on the characteristics of 17th and 18th century Cambridge bindings. The title is John Bagford's observation. We have places that have been famous for binding, as Cambridge, Eton and London. David. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. And thank you again, everybody, both here in the room and online, wherever you are in the world, um, for coming to, to hear this tonight. Um, I ended my first lecture, as Suzanne said yesterday, at the end of the 16th century, having tried to chart the evolution of Cambridge bookbinding from the beginning of tooled leather work around the 1470s to the era of centrepiece bindings in the last quarter of the 16th century. Today, I plan to carry the story on to the late 18th century, taking my title from, as Suzanne said, a, a well-known observation which John Bagford made around the turn of the 18th century um, about uh, the reputation which Cambridge binders, with others, but you'll note that Cambridge comes first in, the, in his quotation. Um, OK, it starts with a C. Um, uh, but, you know, the reputation which Cambridge binders had then achieved for the quality of their work. And it's a quotation which does make make sense because a lot of Cambridge binding work of the 17th century did stand out in the context of English binding more generally for the skill and for the elegance of its craftsmanship. That phrase about the context of English work in general is an important one because Cambridge bookbinding always operated within the conventions of the time as regards broader trends in the evolution of design and of materials. I always think that the steady march of ornamental fashion and design ideas across the world of the applied arts and manufactured, manufactured objects generally is rather like one of those airport travelators that, you know, we stand on and they sort of gradually, gradually move along, slowly but constantly moving so that Things made in 1600 look different from ones that are made in 1550, while those made in 1650 look different again. It's always constantly but slowly moving along, the, the, the travelator of fashion, of design, of pattern, of ornamental vocabulary. And it certainly applies to bookbinding, where even simple and plain work is generally datable from its design characteristics, and the eye can tell at a glance what's often very complicated to put into words. What you see in London binding as the 16th century turned into the 17th is a continued use of centrepiece tools and, less commonly, of broad rolls, alongside a marked increase in much more simply decorated bindings using only blind lines on leather at the more basic end of the market. <clears throat> 
And Cambridge binding evolved similarly, similarly, though with some twists of its own. Both centrepieces and broad rolls declined markedly in Cambridge use after 1600. The last roll, bi roll binding of that sort of broad 16th century roll type that I've seen made in Cambridge is this one on the screen here, which is now in the University Library, and was certainly made not later than 1605. This seems to be the last of those big centrepiece tools to have been used in Cambridge, which had a life continuing into the 1620s, though I think it was the only tool of its kind being used here as late as that. A lot of simpler leather-covered work in early 17th century Cambridge used very narrow rolls around the perimeters, things like this, as well as blind lines. St John's had a lot of books rebound, like the one on the right-hand side of the screen here in the late 1620s, and you'll find examples bound that way in a number of other Cambridge libraries. These books often used quite a heavily sprinkled brown tanned calfskin, which you will also find on another Cambridge favourite of this time, using blind lines and a little tool a bit like a three-pronged fern. And you will see lots of these all over Cambridge if you look on the shelves. You may notice that these books don't have the bumpy spines that we normally see in early bindings, raised bands in binding terminology, which reflect the underlying skeleton of the book, the sewing supports to which the text block is attached and which are run across the spine beneath the leather. During the first half of the 17th century, it became popular to hide those supports by, uh, by um, sewing grooves into the back of the text block and then recessing the supports in so that you could achieve that smooth exterior to the covered spine. It's one of those fashions around ways of doing things that went in and out of vogue and which help us to date bindings. It's not specific to Cambridge at that time. You'll see lots of flat spines in London work of the first half of the 17th century. These do, these last couple of slides, though, do all come from the simpler end of things, of that spectrum of options that I mentioned in my last lecture and that I think is always an important principle to bear in mind. Bookbinders of all periods always offered a spectrum of choice, a range of choices to their customers. So you could do rather better than this if you were willing to pay a bit more. During the opening decades of the 17th century, new sets of tools came into Cambridge workshops, smaller, with a very different look and feel from those centrepieces and their associated fleurons. They were usually laid out in patterns with a big central focus, but made up of symmetrical arrangements of those smaller tools. They could be blind stamped and relatively simple, like the one in the, on the left-hand side here, or they could be more elaborate with multicolored stamping effects or the enhancement of red paint, like the big one on the right. Some of the fanciest ones, like this, were given little four-edge flaps, stiffened with pasteboard and decorated in harmony with the covers and the spines. The tools involved included some quite distinctive shapes, inspired by flowers or creatures from the natural world. The most readily recognisable one, I think, being the flying pheasant, that features in several of, of the designs that were on the last slide, but which was also commonly used on much simpler bindings, like the one on the left-hand side here. Uh, there were lots of student textbooks and things like that bound in Cambridge around the 1620s that just had the flying pheasant in the middle blind-tooled onto quite simple uh, calfskin bindings. Many of these bindings were made in workshops that were run by Henry Moody or Daniel Boyce, who were two Cambridge binders whose names regularly turn up in university or college accounts um, and allow us to tie up the bindings with their suppliers. Moody was the elder of the two 
first heard of as a binder in Cambridge in 1600, which is when this document dates from Henricus Moody, um, De Cant in Comcant Bookbinder. Um, uh, Boyce was a few years younger, and the relationship between the two is not clear. Uh, Miriam Foote, who studied their work in detail, found quite a lot of fuzzy edges between tool groups that seemed to have been associated with one or the other. They were both regularly commissioned to produce luxury bindings on copies of university commemorative verses of the kind that were printed to mark significant royal or national occasions, and surviving copies of those help us to make those kinds of connections between the books um, and the binders from whom the work was commissioned. Thinking about comparisons and contrasts between different English binding centres, it is certainly the case that there are distinctive features of Cambridge work of this time that help us to justify Bagford's comment. Cambridge was in the vanguard of design evolution in English binding in moving away from large centerpiece blocks to symmetrical small tool layouts, which did come to dominate upmarket London binding in the 1630s and 1640s, but didn't become so noticeable there until a little bit later than you do see these things happening in Cambridge. The best quality bindings of this time would typically be covered in goatskin rather than calf, which was sometimes used in Cambridge then, but Cambridge binders used a wider and a more unusual palette of covering materials. Some of their work has been identified as purple dyed doe skin, uh, like the one on the left here, while even my conservator friends uh, have struggled to identify exactly what was used on that mid-1620s Cambridge binding in the middle of the picture here. Uh, they think it's toward calfskin. There is, I think, a marked contrast between the two university towns at this time. Nothing like this was going on in Oxford. There are just as many early Oxford bindings as there are Cambridge ones, and there was an active binding trade going on in Oxford throughout all of, all of these centuries. But its output in the early decades of the 17th century does look very pedestrian in design terms, I think, when compared with what was being done in Cambridge. Oxford binders continued to use the kinds of centerpieces and broad rolls that are more typical of 16th century work until the early 1630s. These are all examples of uh, bindings which were made in Oxford in the early decades of the 17th century. And in the context of what was being done in Cambridge then, I think they would have looked quite old fashioned. The binding travelator never stops moving, and new ideas are always coming along. One thing that happens in the 1630s here is the falling out of use of the tool set of the 1610s and 20s. Um, you know, they don't last very long, and they do move and change quite fast. And the replacement of that earlier tool set with a new one very similar to the others and clearly modelled on them. Um, so the ones on the left are 1610s and 20s, the ones on the right are, are 1630s. And uh, it's, it's very obvious that you know, they are, they are modelled the one on the other, but they are different. And whether this is Moody's operation, refreshing worn out tools, or somebody else in Cambridge exercising imitation as the sincerest form of flattery, I don't know. There were numerous binders operating in Cambridge around this time. It's not just Moody and Boyce, for most of whom we don't have identifiable bindings. One of the most distinctive decorative schemes that's associated with high-end Cambridge work of this time is what G.D. Hobson nicknamed the Chinese box style, with lots of gilt-tooled concentric rectangles converging on a central focus. Bindings like this were sometimes made elsewhere, elsewhere but they are particularly associated with Cambridge around this time. There's an intriguing group of bindings like this, which is associated with John Cousin, the master of Peterhouse, 
in the 1630s and a champion of Laudian theological politics, which may have been made in Little Gidding alongside the famous biblical harmonies made there, um, where uh, you know, they are supposed to have learned to bind from a Cambridge bookbinder's daughter. But uh, that's a story into which I don't have time to digress today. The decoration of these Chinese box style bindings uh, usually includes very tiny tools at the corners of the rectangle of a kind that are also regularly found on another type of binding that's very characteristic of Cambridge work around the late 1630s, early 1640s, less visually striking but quite distinctive that uses a very dark brown calfskin and quite minimal tooling. They aren't the same as the sombre bindings of the post-restoration period. They are quite distinctive, and they come in a sufficient variety of decorative and structural features, I think, to show that they must have been the work of more than one bindery. <coughs> the name which is best known in the context of mid-17th century Cambridge binding is that of John Holden, um, who is first heard of when he got married in 1612 and who begins to appear in accounts for binding work in Cambridge in the early 1630s. He seems to have worked originally with or for Henry Moody, but after Moody's death in 1637, he became established as the go-to binder for um, better quality work in Cambridge. And his workshop was capable of producing very elaborate bindings, like the one on the left here, but he was also regularly commissioned by the university and the colleges to undertake more routine work, like the one in the middle and the one on the left, on the right. In the 1650s, William Dugdale presented copies of some of his books to the university library, and Holden was instructed to produce something that I think was in between those two ends of the spectrum, of which this is the main surviving example, and which those of you who were here last night may have seen out on the table um, at the back end of the wine. Uh, nicely executed in brown calfskin with a gilt tooled goatskin onlay at the centres. It makes use of marbled paper for its end leaves, which is something that you first start to see in Cambridge in the 1630s. The layout scheme of that one um, and of a number of, of those mid-17th century bindings foreshadows the design idea which came to dominate English binding work more generally in the later decades of the century, not only in Cambridge but, but elsewhere too, when countless thousands of bindings were turned out looking something like this, with a simple rectangular frame on the covers, um, enhanced with a modest fleur on a little tool at the corners of the inner frame. The big one on the screen here was made for the University Library in 1667, and it's typical of many, many others that I could put on the screen, like those on the right that mid-brown, sometimes slightly sprinkled tanned calfskin is very characteristic of a lot of Cambridge work of this time. You may note that the smooth spines that we saw earlier in the 17th century have now largely fallen out of fashion and raised bands have returned. These kinds of bindings will often have sprinkled leaf edges and a narrow gilt roll around the board edges and an end leaf construction that you see again and again in 17th century Cambridge work, two plain paper fly leaves folded at the hinge with some projecting stubs and paste downs made from a separate piece of paper. You can see there's a clear gap there, you know, they're not all one conjugate piece of paper. And you will see that end leaf construction, as I say, again and again in Cambridge binding work. Not only in Cambridge binding work, it's, you know, like all these things, you know, uh, there are very few silver bullets. There are very few things where you can say, now, if you see that, that is definitely Cambridge construction. Sadly, it's not quite that simple. The University Library commissioned hundreds of bindings like this, many of them billed to one of several people who were called Jonathan Pindar, who held the office of under-library keeper from the middle of the 17th century into the early 18th. <coughs> 
Identifying these Pindars and finding out much about them is a slippery business, even in an age of genealogical databases, because uh, they haven't left a lot of documentary footprint behind, and there were a lot of Pindars and Pindurs in and around Cambridge at that time. John Oates, when he was uh, writing his history of Cambridge University Library, did battle with the Pindar family tree, and he did find it very exasperating. There were at least three of them, and the first one is, uh, was binding books for Gonville and Keyes as early as 1619. Whether the later Pindars were actually bookbinders or whether they were the library's agents who handled the bills that they farmed out for binding work is an obvious question to ask. But the fact that so many of the books are uniformly bound using tools that don't often turn up elsewhere does suggest the existence of a genuine Pindar bindery. There are hundreds of books on the UL shelves that look like this. Some of them new publications of the 1670s and 80s, lots of them older books sent for rebinding, regularly using um, uh, small tool, several small tools, but this one particularly often. And it's another of those cases that, like others I've already mentioned, where there is a particular tool dis design that clearly spawned a lot of very close variants that were all used in Cambridge around the same time. The one at the top left here is the Pindar tool, but the others were also in use here and not all associated with Pindar. So again, perhaps a sign of local tool making work, so hard to get under the bonnet of how these trade networks, how these trade relationships operated in detail. And I'll say a little bit more about this in my next lecture. Um, but largely along the same lines, it's very hard to find primary evidence to give you concrete answers to the questions which what you see invite you to ask. <clears throat> Anybody who has encountered any quantity of early 18th century English binding work is sure to have seen lots of bindings that look like this, which became the default option for turning out a leather covered book that was no more expensive than it needed to be during the first quarter of the 18th century. They may also have heard it described as a Cambridge panel binding, a particularly unfortunate nickname of the kind that binding terminology is sadly riddled with because it didn't originate in Cambridge and it certainly wasn't uniquely practiced here. Countless thousands of bindings like this were made in London workshops and elsewhere, though they were also made in Cambridge. The origin of the name Cambridge panel style was traced back by Graham Pollard to the middle of the 19th century, when it was already familiar to somebody who was writing in the book finisher's friendly circular. But it's a term that has been repeated constantly and defined since by a lot of people who should know better and should actually be trying to get rid of it rather than, uh, rather than endlessly reproduce it. Stylistically, I think the design can obviously be seen as an evolution of that rectangular frame design that we've just been looking at, but there's an additional frame and the patterning is achieved by sprinkling or mottling the leather with some kind of acid solution to achieve that multi-toning effect. Bindings like this were certainly being made in England in the 1690s, perhaps slightly earlier. Uh, I've seen Cambridge ones which date from the 1690s, and this is an example that's on the screen. Lots were made in Cambridge, but as I say, lots were made in London and elsewhere too, until the 1730s or thereabouts when their popularity began to decline. You could elaborate on the basic design idea by toning the leather a bit more imaginatively, by a bit of sponging or dabbing of the surface. And the one on the left here was made for the University Library in the 1710s. And Cambridge binders do seem to have had a noticeable fondness for stenciling a central lozenge in the middle panel. And I have seen one even more imaginative one. This is in Queens today, uh, where there's a sort of butterfly wing effect being stenciled onto the covers. Uh, and that's quite unusual. <clears throat> 
This is all, though, basic run-of-the-mill kind of work that was produced in great quantities to meet the needs of students, of academics, of professional people of all sorts who wanted books in sound and serviceable condition, fit to read and keep on their shelves thereafter. The Cambridge binding trade did also uh, manage to rise to more aspirational commissions, and after the death of John Holden around 1670, it was his son-in-law Titus Tillett who took over his bindery and continued the tradition of producing elaborately decorated copies of university congratulatory verses. Uh, the one on the left here being one of his more spectacular examples. He also generated many copies of such verses, more simply but distinctively bound in plain velvet in a range of different colours. And the one on the screen is particularly fortunate in managing to retain its matching silk ties. <clears throat> a late 17th century Cambridge shop, which exemplifies the range of work which uh, such a bindery could produce, was run by Thomas Dawson, who was born in Cambridge in 1634 and admitted to the role of privileged persons of the university as a stationer in 1664. He established a flourishing business in bookselling as well as binding, which was carried on after his death in 1708 by his son of the same name. Dawson regularly features as a supplier in university and college accounts, and these are all examples of straightforward, simply decorated bindings produced by the Dawson bindery during the late Stuart period, of the kind which found their way onto such shelves. But the same tools were also used sometimes, gilt-tooled on goatskin, on more elaborate work from the same place. There were always in-between options as well, and there are numerous sets of the quarto classical texts printed in Cambridge at the turn of the 18th century to help to re-establish the university press in Dawson bindings that look something like this. I have seen one Dawson example uh, in the sombre binding style, which was popular in English binding in the Restoration period, where black leather was wholly blind tooled alongside, alongside black stained leaf edges to produce something intended to remind us of our creator in the days of our youth, or something like that. Um, and this example of a sombre binding from the Dawson workshop on a Bible was given to Gonville and Keyes in 1674 by one of the college fellows, and I'm sure it would have been commissioned by him rather than by the college. This is the time, the back end of the 17th century, when book owners were moving their books around on their shelves to start to sort of store them spine outwards rather than spine inwards, as had been the convention hitherto. And Cambridge binders, like English binders more generally, began turning their hands to spine labelling. Through the 18th century, many libraries commissioned binders to work around their shelves to add title labels to 16th and 17th century bindings, which didn't have them. And you'll see plentiful examples of that in, for example, the university library. If you call up a book that's been there for 300 years or more, its binding may be contemporary with the imprint, but its spine label will be later. The earliest experimentation with spine labelling, spine labelling in Cambridge dates from the 1630s, when some of those very dark brown, very simply tooled bindings that I had on the screen earlier uh, are sometimes found with lettering gilt tooled directly onto the spine. The results, as seen on the left-hand side here, are usually quite crude, but it's striking that it was being done at all as early as that. It's from the 1670s onwards that Cambridge binders started to do it more systematically, and it's something which clearly improved with practice. Uh, in the example in the middle from the early 1670s, the title was tooled directly onto the spine with gold lettering and little gold tools put on top of blind lines which were actually already there. The tooling and the lettering is pretty uneven. The word truncation is clumsy. They did get better at it, uh, as you can see from the right-hand examples, which are 18th century ones, 
But it's not until well into the 18th century that the idea of spine labeling on new bindings as a matter of course, as a standard convention, uh, became typical practice. The university library, like most institutional libraries, had to rely on donations more than purchases through its early centuries of life, as there were no dedicated acquisition funds. New publications began to flow in more regularly from the late 17th century onwards when Tobias Rostat's philanthropy created a purchase fund around 1670 and the 1710 Copyright Act called for the deposit of new books uh, in Oxford and Cambridge, which typically arrived, albeit spasmodic spasmodically, in unbound sheets. Those developments generated work for Cambridge binders, and the university accounts show us that it was farmed out across a number of Cambridge workshops uh, who were active here in the first half of the 18th century. Uh, John Oates identified surviving books on the library shelves and put them together in a classified set of sequences at the press mark REL F in the UL. Um, uh, where you can find them still, all, all put together, um, or grouped together at that press mark. It's limited only by its time span, um, which covers only three decades, from about 1710 to about 1740, but it is the only place in Cambridge, as far as I know, where you can find a collection of Cambridge bindings which have been put together on that basis. All of this work made for the library then was very much of the bread and butter kind, lots of Cambridge panel style bindings, alongside that standard late 17th century design idea, which continued to be made here until about 1720. <clears throat> Fancy binding in Cambridge uh, in the mid 18th century typically came from the workshop of Edwin Moore, who was born here in 1701 and is regularly found in university and college accounts for binding work from the late 1730s onwards. He took over the bindery of the younger Thomas Dawson and may originally have been his apprentice or worked for him. Numerous bindings from his workshops survive, the best known being in gilt tooled goatskin or calfskin, decorated according to the standard English design then for more upmarket work, where you have a central lozenge which is made up of symmetrically arranged small tools surrounded by um, a broad border um, made up of one or more rolls or separate tools or a mixture of both, uh, like the examples on the screen here. It's what's commonly called a Harleian binding because um, Edward Lord Harley, one of the best known early 18th century bibliophiles, had a lot of them. But like so many binding nicknames, it's deeply unhelpful because the majority of bindings like this that you will see had nothing to do with Harley, never belonged to him, uh, were never commissioned to him, um, including Moore's. Why is it that bookbinding terminology is so full of nonsense? A topic for another day, perhaps. <clears throat> the Moore bindery produced lots of bindings like this between about 1740 and Moore's death in 1773. Um, and it's one of those that Tim Munby is holding in the famous and much reproduced picture of him uh, that you will see on the King's website and uh, reproduced in many other places too. But Moore's workshop, like Moody's or Holden's or Dawson's or any of them, spent more of its time generating more routine bindings for the library shelves of Cambridge, like this one from a two-volume set that was bound for the university library um, by Moore or Moore's bindery in, uh, uh, in 1750. The terminal date for my study of Cambridge bindings, 1770, was chosen partly because it more or less con coincides with Moore's death and partly because as the 18th century progressed, the more routine binding work carried out in Cambridge became more generic, less easily recognisable within the broader currents of English binding work of the time, depending more on circumstantial than decorative or structural evidence to identify it, rather like the medieval toward skin bindings that I was talking about at the beginning. <clears throat> 
Mid 18th century plain leather bindings made in Cambridge are often very minimally decorated and constructed according to standard techniques for English work of the time. The one on the left here was bound for the UL in the 1750s, while I'm pretty sure that the one on the right is also a Cambridge binding because it's a Cambridge imprint first owned by a Cambridge man. <clears throat> but it's those more secondary kinds of evidence that allows the identification in these cases rather than any characteristics of the binding as we can independently observe it. As in English binding work more broadly, <clears throat> the 18th century saw the making of a lot of half and quarter cuffs, quarter leather structures as a cheaper alternative to full leather uh, where you have paper covered boards and uh, the leather is only around the spine and possibly at the, at the tips of the boards for a bit of extra, uh, extra protection. It's cheaper than using full leather. And the university library commissioned many hundreds of these from the 1730s onwards. There are lots of them on the shelves which have a, a peculiar and rather wishy-washy, quite distinctive marbled paper on the covers on a, of a comb marbled pattern, and also one with a, ones with a mottled yellow paper like the one in the middle. If you go to Queen's College, you can see hundreds and hundreds in half sheep with blue paper on the boards, like the one on the right, um, made for Daniel Hughes in the 1760s and 1770s. There was, unsurprisingly, lots of this kind of bread and butter work going on uh, in Cambridge at that time, but it's rarely going to be attributable when it's found outside a local context and you've got those local bits of secondary evidence, as it were, that enable you to make the, the localization, the attribution in that sense. Seventeenth and eighteenth century Cambridge bindings provide rather more opportunities, perhaps than sixteenth century ones, to observe relationships between customers and binders, and particularly some ways in which the spectrum of choices around quality and cost was exercised. A case study of this kind already exists in the work which John Oates did on early seventeenth century sets of uh, university congratulatory verses. Uh, which he published in the Cambridge Bibsock Transactions in 1953. He analysed the bills in the university accounts from Henry Moody and Daniel Boyce for binding these in varying grades of quality, according to the recipient, from which it's clear that there were finely graded divisions reflecting the social hierarchy. In May 1625, the cost of binding the set of verses for presentation to the king was nine shillings, while another copy at eight shillings was described on the bill as the fairest next, perhaps destined for another member of the royal family or the Duke of Buckingham, don't know, after which we have six shillings for the fairest next to that. The bindings would be distinguished by their levels of gilding, decoration, other enhancements. These bills refer to different kinds of lace and ribbon, to Venice gold edging, spangled bone lace, and sometimes to perfuming the books. Although I've never come across one that you, where you can still smell the perfume today, but they, you know, they clearly did it. You know, they, they got their, you know, their little spray. Um, uh, lots of copies for more ordinary recipients were simply bound in plain limp parchment covers and they were charged at sixpence apiece. A similar pattern can be observed if we look at the wide range of bindings which you can find today on copies of Ab Abraham Wellock's 1643 edition of the works of Bede. Wellock, Wheelock, I think there are varying views on the right way to pronounce his surname, Died in 1653, he was the university librarian and also the university's first professor of Anglo-Saxon. Among his many scholarly achievements, his editio princeps of the old English version of Bede, published alongside the Latin text, was a significant milestone. It was printed here by the university printer, Roger Daniel, uh, and reprinted with an additional text the following year. Many copies of this 1643 edition survive, now found in libraries all over the world. 
They're not all in Cambridge bindings. Some were bound in London and elsewhere soon after printing, uh, and copies have been rebound over the centuries. But there are plenty of surviving examples which definitely are in Cambridge bindings. It wasn't an official university publication the way that the congratulatory verses were, and there are no binding bills in the university accounts. Wellock himself gave copies to many of the colleges, and a lot of them remain there today with a presentation inscription to that effect that um, uh, they were given by, by Wellock. They seem to have been given to the colleges as unbound sheets, uh, as the cost of binding them is recorded in several college accounts. They were sent to Holden to bind, and um, these are all examples of what came back. Some were done to an almost identical pattern, as you can see on the right-hand side there, um, but some were a little bit different. But they're all what you might call a bit better than middling quality bindings of their time. Dark brown calfskin with some central gilt decoration made up from small tools. These generally cost the colleges three shillings apiece for the binding. <clears throat> but there were also copies needed for grandees. And there were at least three bound in Holden's workshop in elaborately gilded black goatskin. The one on the left we saw earlier when I introduced Holden uh, and is in the university library here. The one in the middle is now in the Bodleian, and I don't know where the one on the right is. It was sold at Bloomsbury Book Auctions in 2014. The Bodleian one was given to John Selden by Henry Rich, Earl of Holland, who was the Chancellor of Cambridge University in the 1640s and must surely have been presented with the book in that capacity. The UL one came here in 1714 as part of John Moore's collection and we don't know who it originally belonged to. Likewise, I don't know the early provenance of the one on the right. I'm assuming that these were bound at Wheelock's expense, though he is known to have complained about being hard up. He suffered all his life from pecuni pecuniary anxiety, is the rather more formal phrase in the DNB, but maybe it was binding costs as well as the costs of providing for a large family that contributed to his anxiety. In between, uh, I know of two Holden identically bound copies, which aren't quite as fancy as the slide before last, but certainly fa quite as fancy as the last slide, but fancier than the one before. Um, uh, and one of these is now in St Paul's Cathedral Library, the one on the left-hand side here. Uh, it originally belonged to the master of a college, Richard Stern. So he clearly sat a bit lower down the social scale than the Chancellor, but was still a person of some standing and needed more guilt than would be applied to the copy on his college library shelves. At the more basic level, there would have been lots of copies bound and sold in Cambridge in bindings that were no better than they needed to be, um, in plain calfskin with minimal tooling, um, and the copy that is now in Magdalen College, which is the one in the middle, uh, very much fits that pattern. Um, I, I think this is not Wellock's presentation copy to the college. Um, or the one in Peterborough Cathedral Library, uh, the one on the right here, whose little <coughs> tiny tools are recognisably those of the Holden bindery. Wellock's bead not only allows us to observe that broad spectrum of binding choices uh, and the motivations behind them, but also another of those compare and contrast opportunities, I think, between Cambridge and Oxford. It's long struck me that in both the university towns around this time, there were initiatives to showcase local talent through blockbuster scholarly editions produced at the university presses. The Oxford equivalent of Wellock's Bede is surely Patrick Young's 1633 edition of the Epistles of Pope Clement I, patronised and encouraged by Lord, and noted by Will Poole as setting the benchmark of the learned press, both for scholarship and typography, widely praised at home and abroad. But I've never found any evidence to suggest that Oxford binders produced upmarket copies of it, uh, or that you'll find it in that range of local binding options, such as we find here in Cambridge ten years later. 
That kind of book culture seems to have been missing in Oxford, which seems contrary to the Laudian way of doing things, thinking how active he was in promoting libraries, printing, and scholarly editing. Um, I, I don't have the answer to that puzzle. I throw that one out to the 17th century uh, intellectual and political historians here for, uh, for an answer. Those kinds of pecking orders around presentation copies of books can be seen in various other examples. In the early 1630s, the well-known Cambridge Hebraist and eschatologist Joseph Mead gave a copy of his Clavis Apocalyptica to John Williams, who was then Bishop of Lincoln, and he had it put into elaborately gilt tool binding uh, in purple dyed goat skin, gilt gophered edges, uh, the one on the left-hand side here. Another copy with a similar handwritten presentation inscription from Mead was given to the wealthy businessman and politician Sir Nathaniel Rich, who also merited some gilt tooling, but clearly something uh, visibly less expensive uh, than the one uh, that was given to Williams. I imagine that many more copies were given out by Mead, and if we could find them all today, I think uh, we'd see another of those long graduated spectrums if the books survive in their original bindings. So I think we've seen plentiful evidence today or to support John Bagford's endorsement of the quality of Cambridge binding work, and it's clear from his statement that its reputation was known beyond the banks of the CAM. One of the questions which we might reasonably ask, therefore, is whether people from further afield sought out Cambridge binders in the way that today we might commission craftsmen from anywhere to do binding work for us based on their profile and their portfolio. And I think the answer to that question, perhaps rather disappointingly, is no. It wasn't part of the culture of the time to do that. I have seen no evidence of anyone from beyond Cambridge or its hinterland seeking out Cambridge binders to make their books for them, though I'd be very interested to hear from anyone who thinks they might have such evidence. By hinterland, I do mean East Anglia more widely, and I don't think it would be unusual to find Cambridge bindings bought for, for example, a gentry house in Norfolk. But I don't think anyone who could conveniently patronise a nearer binding centre would seek out Cambridge binders. There was plenty of capacity for binding work of all kinds in London, and wealthy East Anglian families would be just as likely to source their books there uh, as here. Sir Thomas Nivett, who lived in Ashwell Thorpe, a little way outside Norwich, and whose library is known to us today through David McKittrick's catalogue, had lots of London bindings and was clearly regularly sourcing books from there. What we do see sometimes are local Cambridge authors whose books printed in Cambridge were bound up in batches here for them. Uh, there are, for example, numerous copies of John Davenant's commentary on Colossians printed here in Cambridge in 1627, which look like this. And just into the 18th century, when Daniel Newhouse had his Art of Sailing by Logarithms printed in London, but wanted to present copies to Cambridge colleges, he had Thomas Dawson run up a number of them in very similar gilt-tooled red goatskin bindings like these. Another question which I have not uncommonly been asked when talking about 17th century English bindings is what effect the Civil War and the Interregnum had on the binding trade? To which my answer is not much, not what you might expect, based on the output of the workshops. My sense is that the travelator of ornament and design continued its steady march through uh, the 1640s and 1650s up to the 1660s, just as it did before and afterwards. And there was certainly no suppression of luxury or exuberance of design, no cancellation of Christmas in the bindery. We saw earlier some of the bindings which the Holden workshop was making in Cambridge in 1643, at a time when senior academics were being arrested or ejected and college revenues were being sequestered. In 1657, Holden was able to produce a binding like this. Um, uh, 
it always seemed to me that below the theatre of political turmoil and theological strife that was being played out by senior figures, ordinary citizens like bookbinders kept their heads down and tried their best to get on with normal life. So another answer, another question whose answer is not, I think, the one that you might expect, but I would be glad of any comments from social historians here to help to refine those perceptions. I will leave you today with uh, one of those little puzzles <clears throat> of Cambridge binding work of this period. This is a commonly encountered Cambridge binding tool of the late 17th century. <clears throat> I know of well over 100 examples, and I doubt that there's a historic library here in Cambridge where you won't find some. Um, and you'll find lots more in libraries all around the world. As a little fleuron tool of this period, of the kind that goes at the corners of, of frames, uh, its design is wholly unexceptional. But what is unusual about it is the fact that it's got the letters IW quite clearly tooled into the design. I mentioned last time that some of the roles, the early 16th century roles that were associated with Godfrey and Spearing, incorporate their initials. And at that time, it was not unusual. But 150 years later, it was very unusual indeed. And this is not a time when binders signed their work. The tool stands out as distinctively different amongst hundreds of others used in English binderies around this time. The obvious question is, what does IW stand for? And I don't know. I wrote a short piece about this particular tool in the book collector about 20 years ago, and nobody came forward with the answer then, nor have they since. Here's your chance. There are no Cambridge bookbinders or booksellers of that time whose initials fit. Um, it began to be used in the late 1670s, and the latest use that I've seen, where the tool does look very worn, is on a 1729 imprint, which is now in Peterhouse. It usually appears on its own, so matching it up with other tool sets is often not possible, but I have seen it on bindings which also have tools associated with the Dawson bindery. In 1722, it was used on a book bound for the University Library by the local bookbinder, Charles Wright. I've never seen it gilt-tooled, and it's usually deployed on quite simple brown calfskin bindings of the kind that are so typical of standard Cambridge work of that period. IW could, of course, be an engraver or a toolmaker's initials, or it could stand for some kind of motto or religious tag. They could conceivably be an owner's initials who asked for it to be made like this before it was used in more general circulation, but I think that is very unlikely. There was a very similar tool used in Cambridge without the initials, the initials though it's not the same tool with the initials not there. I think you can see that. And as a design, this, this, this ornament, you know, you'll see this, this kind of tool used um, in lots of places um, in English binding around that time. I know there are a few other instances of English binding tools of this period incorporating initials in this kind of way. Uh, I know that Nicholas Pickwode has seen a few, which he's, he's reported. Um, but compared with the IW tool, which is really quite commonly seen, these other ones are, are quite rare. It's a mystery, and what better way to end a lecture? It's rather like wild cigarette, you know, it's both exquisite and unsatisfying. <laughs> Answers on a postcard, please. In my next and final lecture tomorrow, uh, I will look more closely at binders and trade networks, at customers, and at our philosophies and our methodologies around looking at bindings. And I will hope to see you all again then. Thank you.